Well, what Mike just read for us is at the end of the message. We're, we have to get through a little material to get there, but we will get there. And uh, we invited uh, Clint Eastwood to join us today. If you look at the title of the message there, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, of course, is the gospel. The bad and the ugly, of course, are the beast and Babylon. And we'll see how that, how that unfolds as we go along. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So, there was a beginning. Correct? And in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Now if there's a beginning... It seems logical that there will be what? An end. Yes. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Now, we still have more to go. We're, we're into these cycles, you know, remember. And so, we've come to the end now. But we'll see more as we go along. Just as surely as there was a beginning, there will be an end. Now, the last time, it's been two weeks, I realize, because we, we had Father's Day in between, but the last time we looked at what was happening in heaven at this time period. The spotlight now turns to earth with proclamations by three angels that come into our purview here. Each angel bears words of warning to those in league with the dragon, the beast, and the harlot Babylon. Now, we know that these are symbols, right? We've, looked, we've gone through this enough. We've pretty well got the symbol thing down. And we've identified these, the, the dragon as Satan and the beast as, as uh, his agent who carries out his, his wishes as, as best he can. But uh, Babylon is kind of new to us, isn't it? We, we haven't seen that before, so we'll touch on that here in a few minutes. But I just want to remind us now of our time sequence during this, as this pageant plays out, our time sequence doesn't really begin in Genesis 1-1, but it begins with the coming of Christ. And we're dealing with the time, the time of the tribulation is the time between the coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And we've got that down, we pretty well know that now. So we are now going to see what's happening on earth as God prepares to wrap things up. And we'll see this in these three angels. So we're going to be in, in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. These are these three angels. So the first angel shows up, and here's what it says. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Just want to stop for a minute and, and talk about this eternal gospel that the angel is bringing. That is indeed the good in our good, bad, and ugly scenario, isn't it? In fact, the word gospel, uh, most of you know, uh, actually means good news or a good message or whatever. And the gospel in a nutshell is simply Jesus came to earth to offer salvation to us, to all who believe. Okay? That's the eternal gospel. Uh, there's no way we can enter into God's presence except through Jesus Christ. That's what he said, right? Okay. He's the door. He's the way. There is no other way. So we go back. Now, this eternal gospel is for all. We would have to go clear back into Isaiah. And now the people, remember this is written to the seven churches. The people would have recognized this right away. And they would have thought of Isaiah. And they would have thought of what we think of as Christmas verses. You know? Right? Now you go back over here and you all will remember in Isaiah 7 14 therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign behold a virgin will conceive bear a child and we will call his name Emmanuel and over in 9 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given 
And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news, the birth of Christ, and that's the beginning of our time period that we're working with. Now the Jews that populated predominantly these seven churches would have immediately thought about that. And they would have said, yeah, that's true. But what they wouldn't have agreed with was the fact that it was an eternal gospel for all. They would have thought it was an exclusive gospel for them. The Jews were still looking forward to Christ's coming. In fact, if you, if you were, met a, a good Jew today, uh, they would say, He is coming. And they would be talking about the Messiah. But you meet one of us today, and what do we say? He has come. That's the difference. So while the Jews were looking only forward, we are looking both past, present, and future, right? We know that he has come, we know that he is here with us, and we know that he is coming again to consummate the kingdom. So what should our response be to all this? Our response should be just as we were singing we should give him worship. We should give him glory. We should give him honor. We should give him praise. We should live our lives in a way that would do that. But there is a problem. What happens? Well, what do we do? We see here that they talk about him as the God who made heaven, earth, sea and water. Now we don't have any problem with that, do we? No. Because you read it in Genesis 1. But look what happens. Paul uh, tells us about it in, in the first chapter of the book of Romans. And in verse uh, 22 it says this, claiming to be wise they became fools. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So you see what happened is, not you and I as individuals now, but mankind in general, they take their eyes from the Creator and put it on the creation, or they remake the creator in some form they like, and say, this is what God is like, therefore I will worship this. Or they say, well, look at this beautiful creation, I will worship that. They, or they become pantheistic, and they say, well, God is in everything, and so I can go up here on the mountain and worship a tree, and that's just as good as worshiping the great living God. And we say, in our 21st century uh, intellectualism, we say, well, that's so much foolishness. But let me ask you a question. Are there not people living right now that worship the creation? Okay. Sure there are. Mm -hmm. Are there not people living now that would put the welfare of animals above the welfare of humankind? Sure there are. Now, I'm all for the welfare of animals. And we own three of them, and we love them, and they're great. But I'm not going to put their welfare above a human's welfare. You see, God created an order. And ever since the fall, everything got turned on its head, so people tend to worship the wrong things, you see. And you say, well, I'm not one of those wacko environmentalists. I, what are you, you can't be talking about me. Well, maybe not, but then what do we worship? We worship recreation, we worship our, our, our vocation, we, wor we can worship all kinds of things. And so we're susceptible to this also. So we need to just understand that we are susceptible and consciously, continually be redirecting our thoughts and our actions and our praise to God who created all these things. And you, you, know, you go beyond what we think of when we think about creation. Who created recreation? 
It was God who gives you the ability to indulge in that recreation. It's God. It's our Creator who created work. God. Remember, He put Adam in the garden to work. So whatever it is we find to focus our, our strengths and our talents and our finances on, it should all be secondary to God who created it all and who gives us the, the ability to engage in it. So that's the first angel. He brings really good news. This gospel is for everybody. Not just the Jews. Not just Americans. Not just whomever. It's for everybody. The second angel, verse 8. Another angel, the second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Oh, pretty heavy. Babylon the great. We're introduced to a new symbol. What do we think of when we think of Babylon the great? You know, the, the Bible does this often. Uh, symbols for different things. Now, the Jews would have known. And, and you might say, well, gee, uh, Pastor, uh, Babylon fell to Persia in 539 B.C. 600 years before this book was written, more or less. How, what does Babylon have to do with anything? They're no longer a world power. Haven't been for a little less than 600 years. But now the people who populated those seven churches would have immediately recognized Babylon as the great nemesis of Judea. Who was it that destroyed Jerusalem? Babylonians. Who was it that destroyed the temple? Babylon, you see. What Babylon is here, it's a representation of all that is wrong with this world systems. So when we say Babylon is fallen, we're talking about the time when God does away with that and sets up his kingdom when it's fallen completely. Babylon represents all that is wrong with this world's value system. Greed, avarice, misused power. Yes, it includes sexual immorality. But now when it talks here and, and, and in verse 8 says sexual immorality, yes, it's talking about thou shalt not commit adultery and that sort of thing. But the bigger picture is how does God often refer, often refer to Israel? As a harlot. Because they were always chasing off after other gods. You read the, book, the Old Testament book of Hosea. You find that very plainly. So what he's saying to us is, don't do that. Don't be whoring around, if I can use that term, after other gods. You stay with me. You pursue me. Don't be lured away by Babylon. You know, it's easy to do. You know, because, because Babylon doesn't, doesn't present herself as something evil or something strange. It's always as something good. But it never turns out that way in the end. And now the third angel gives the results of what will happen if we don't heed. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hands, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast in its image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Oh, pretty heavy, isn't it? Now, we've already sorted through what this mark of the beast is. Right? It's not a stamp. It's not an image. It's, it's none of that. The mark of the beast is the fact that we follow after him rather than God. And the seal of the Holy Spirit is the fact that we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. 
They're not physical things. They're inside us. They're in here. And so, what he's saying is whoever buys into this world system to the exclusion of God, those who succumb to the mindset, to the myth that Rome or any world system deserves their ultimate allegiance proves that they have the mark of the beast. As Christians, now, I understand that we're often pressured to buy into these things, aren't we? Because the world tells us its system should be number one, right? Make as much as you can, work as much as you can, get as much as you can, don't let anybody take advantage of you, don't let them take advantage of you, you know, you assert yourself. Well, what does the Gospel say? What does the New Testament say? Yeah. It says, give all you can, love all you can, serve all you can, help all you can. And the world system says, but if you do that, people are going to take advantage of you. And that's true. Did people take advantage of Jesus? Yeah, they hung him on a cross. It's the difference between the world system and God's system. Now I understand we have to make a living, we have to have recreation, we have to do all those things. But we have to do them, we have to keep them in balance. They have to be subordinate to our service to Jesus Christ and His kingdom. And as long as they're subordinate, there are many good things that we can have as long as we keep them in their proper place. So, look at 12 and 13. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven, heaven saying, Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. He's saying here, he's calling for us to be faithful, and he says if you're faithful, you're faithful to the Lord, you may die, in which we all will if he uh, doesn't come back before we get to that point. But it's okay, because we're going to be with him. It's going to be good and our deeds will follow us. So that's a good thing. That's good news. It might be tough until we get there, but it's going to be okay. So then he says, as we move to the end, here's a, a picture of it, the harvest. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Now, all he's saying is, the time has come. It's already been appointed, now the time has come. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's pretty darn deep. Is that what's going to happen? No. That's a symbol. It's a symbol to tell us it's really going to be bad. Okay? But look what we have here now. We have this a typical apocryphal imagery. We, we have a wine press, and we have the wrath of God is the wine press, and, and we have this wheat over here, and the wheat's being harvested, and, and, and we've got this blood flowing in the streets and all of that. What's going on? Well, we have the, 
the harvest of the grain juxtaposed against the pressing of the grapes. What does that mean? Well, we have two categories, right? Don't we see that over and over again? How many kinds of people are there on the earth? Two, right? Those who believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, and those who don't. Everybody in the whole world falls into one of those two camps. In our symbolism here, the harvest of the grain represents those who do. The harvest and pressing of the grapes represents those who do not. So the question for us is, which group do I fall in? And hopefully the answer is the grain. You know, there's a word of caution, though, that I should share with us here. Because it's awful easy when you decide you're in the grain group to look down your noses at those that are in the grape group or to try to ferret them out. Okay. Matthew chapter 13 in the Kingdom of Heaven parables Jesus cautions and says, don't do that. You remember that they came to him and they said, there are tares among the wheat and we want to get them out. And Jesus said, no, you just leave them alone. I'll take care of that at the harvest. And this is the harvest, you see. Judgment belongs to God. We need to always remember that. Judgment belongs to God. There are believers on this earth that don't act like us. There are believers on this earth that don't look like us. There are believers on this earth that don't have their theology perfect as we do. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not supposed to judge them. We're supposed to love them. Uh, we're doing a study in the early church in the, the AM men's group. And uh, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, uh, recounts what a pagan Roman <clears throat> centurion said. And he said this. He says, this is what impresses me about these Christians. What do you think it might be? How they dress? How they act? What they don't do? No. He said, this is what impresses me about these Christians. It's see how they love one another. And believe me, they had some very differing opinions, these Christians did. But somehow, they were able to demonstrate to the world how they loved one another. Now, as you move on through church history, there's been a lot of times when the church didn't demonstrate that very well. Okay. But, and what did Jesus say is the number one way the world will know we're Christians? If we have love one for another. John 13, 33, 34. I think it's the weakest point in Christianity is that we don't demonstrate that love for one another. Oh, we get along, you know. Yeah. But maybe we need to rethink that. So here we are at the end. Two groups. Those who know God. Those who don't know God. And when I say God, I mean Jesus Christ. So now we come to chapter 15. This is what Mike read for us. Now we come to the good stuff because again the scene shifts and now it's in heaven. Then I saw another sign in heaven. Great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues which are the last for with them the wrath of God is finished. Now, I thought you said it was finished and I did. But again, when we get to, this, to the seven plagues, the seven bowls being poured out, what we're getting is details of what we just read. 
in the, in the end of 14. It's, it's like when you read the creation account in Genesis. You read through it in chapter 1, and then God gives it to you again, doesn't he? In chapter 2, yeah. But it's a little different slant because the focus is on man and that. So that's the same thing we're doing here. It's not, it's not unusual. Seven bowls, <clears throat> seven cycles. Just more detailed information of the cosmic conflagration which we glimpsed in the seals and the trumpets. Because you remember we went through the seals and then we went through the trumpets and the trumpets covered the same time period as the seals. It was just more information. And so it will be when we get to the bowls in chapter 16. But for now, we are treated to a glimpse of the destiny of those who claim Jesus as Savior. And that's really what we want to know, isn't it? I want to know what's going to happen to me. What, what's it going to be like for me when I get there? Well, he tells us. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Well here we are with the sea of glass again. We've seen that before haven't we? And you may remember we we said that the sea of glass contrasts with the natural sea because uh, as we'll also see as we get to the end of the book when the New Jerusalem comes down and God establishes his kingdom, there's a couple of things that aren't there. And there is no more sea. Now why is that? Because if you were a Jew, the sea was not your friend. They were never a maritime people. Uh, for them, the sea brought problems. It brought troubles. It brought a group of people called the Philistines. You remember way back in the Old Testament? Philistine means sea peoples. The sea was bad. The sea was harsh. The sea was a place where you drowned. And think about it today. What is the sea doing all the time? It's going out. It's coming in. It's going out. It's coming in. Now we may go to the beach and say that's wonderful and we like to look at it, but they didn't look at it that way. The sea was a troubling place. It was a place of constant commotion. But now we see this sea of glass. And there's no movement. It's all smooth. It's quiet. It's calm. It's peaceful. And now we see that amidst this sea of glass is this fire. Well, what is fire all through the Old Testament into the New Testament? But the presence of God. Right? When God spoke to Moses, how did he appear to him? The fire and the bush. Yeah. And when they went across the wilderness, what did they follow by day? Pillar of fire. And now we have God amongst this calm sea, his presence as a pillar of fire. These are the ones who have conquered the beast. Now we may again say, well, wait a minute, I thought the beast and his agents killed a lot of these people. Didn't he conquer them? Ha <laughs> ha, no. Because they live. And they'll live forever. That's why God tells us not to fear. The beleaguered church on earth, so seemingly weak and outnumbered, must never forget the mystery of God's kingdom growing powerfully through our frailty. We look around our nation today, does the church look like a commanding force? No. Of course not. 
we look like we're weak, we look like we're ineffectual, we look like we're not accomplishing anything. But what's really going on? Again, if you look at the Kingdom of Heaven parables, it's like the leaven introduced into the dough. It, it keeps working unseen until the whole thing is filled with it. It's like the mustard seed, the tiniest seed known at that time. They put it in there and it grows to this big tree. Well, that's the way the kingdom of God is growing here on this earth. You see, we look at the church and we look at a, maybe a hundred year time period generally when, in our minds and we say the church is weak, the church is going downhill, the church is losing its influence. Is God losing his influence? Is God weak? Is the Holy Spirit ineffectual? Well, we'd say no to all those things. Well, it's God's church. The Holy Spirit is in the church because the church is made up of those who love Jesus Christ. Listen to the song these people are singing. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Now these are the folks, many of them, that were killed by the world system. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, the glory and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. It doesn't sound to me like they see themselves, or if they can see into the future, I don't know, as a weak and ineffectual group. They're singing a song of victory. And notice, they sing the song of who? Moses. Now, we have, we've been introduced to Moses' song. I'm sure you all remember. And you could open your Bibles right to it at any moment. Right? <laughs> Moses' song, Exodus chapter 15. And what is the setting? The setting is they are now on the other side of the Red Sea. God has just destroyed all of Pharaoh's army. Now just a, just a few hours or so before they were on the other side of the Red Sea, and their fate seemed sealed, didn't it? In fact, we find Moses, the great leader, frozen as he stands here. You go back and read it for yourself. And he's crying out to God. He says, God, do something. We're all going to die. And God says to him, quit your sniveling and move forward. And you read it. That's what he says. That's a paraphrase. But he does. He says, I quoted exactly, he says, Why are you standing there? Move forward. To Moses' credit, he moved. But he was just like us. You know, we're all human beings. He had to swine a little bit first and hope God would give him an easy way out. And he says, No, you move ahead. And so he did. Sea opened up, they cross, Pharaoh comes along, Pharaoh tries to cross, sea closes up, all of them, they're all dead. Exodus chapter 15, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed victoriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord is God, and I will praise him. That's Moses' song of victory. Now, there's a few more verses to it, but... That's enough. You get the idea. You see. So that's the song they're singing here with different words, but same idea. Now notice. Notice. This is of the utmost importance. In both Moses' song and their song, there's not a, a tinge of uh, arrogance, of vindictiveness, uh, saying... Look what we did to those guys. They think they were going to beat us, but we buried them. No. It's all God did it. God did it. God did it. 
There's no gloating, no prideful proclamations. Just praise to God, for they recognize, as we should, that it was all by God's power that they are conquerors. Okay? Remember Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. We've talked about that a lot. How will the church conquer? Not by might, nor by power, but by God's Spirit. You see? That's how the church will conquer. We need to remember that because when the church has failed to recognize that is when the church got in trouble. You know, we bemoan the fact that we don't have a lot of political power. We bemoan the fact that our leaders aren't Christians. We, we bemoan that. But let me, let me just remind you that the times in history when the church had lots of political clout when the church had Christian leaders, supposedly, what happened? They ran amok. The church became drunk with its own power to use apocalyptical language. It may just be, and some of you may think this is heretical, but it may just be, it's a good thing that we aren't politically powerful. I don't know. But I do know this, if you read a history book, when the church was politically powerful, it was spiritually bankrupt. Draw your own conclusions. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. A final word. Once again we see that there are and have always been and always will be two groups of people. Those who belong to God and those who don't. Both groups will one day meet God. There, there's a harvest of the grain and of the grapes. There will be a radically different experience for those who know Him and those who don't. I would encourage you, I would beseech you, I would beg you to make sure you're in the group that it's a joyous, worshipful, wonderful experience. And I don't know if you're here and you, you, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know, now's the time because there was a beginning and there will be an end. And I don't profess to know when it is. It may be now. It may be a thousand years from now. But if you're vacillating, if you're wondering, if you're not sure, Throw your lot in with Jesus Christ. There was a 17th century mathematician, physicist. His name was Blaise Pascal. And uh, he was a man of logic and science. And there's a very <coughs> famous saying that he came up with called Pascal's Wager. And it, it's, it's a little too long and involved to quote it all. But let me just quote this much with for you. He says, let us weigh the gain and the loss in wagering that God is. Let us estimate these two chances. If you win, you gain everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then without hesitation that God is. It's the same today. God is. And if you throw your lot in with Him, there's nothing to lose if you're wrong and everything to lose. Or nothing to lose if you're wrong and everything to lose if you're right. Pray with me. Father, thank you again for a glimpse into uh, your heaven. And Lord, a reminder that weakness and strength sometimes, physically anyway, are not a good gauge of where we are. It's so difficult to gauge our spiritual strength. So help us, Lord, to understand that. Help us to uh, know that our strength is not, as you said to, to Solomon, it's, it's not in, in horses and it's not in chariots. Because you can throw all those things into the sea in a blink of an eye. Our strength is in you. 
Our strength is in our faith given to us solely by you. And we recognize that, Lord. That if we do believe in you, it's solely by your grace. And therefore we have, we have nothing to gloat about. All our responses should simply be praise and worship. Because the only one who is worthy has called the unworthy ones into his presence. And now, Lord, bless us as we go about our week. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.